Well, I declare the meeting open and I'd uh, uh, like to uh, acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal community as a traditional custody of the land we're meeting on tonight and pay respect to all past and present. And also remind everyone that tonight's meeting is being uh, audio visually recorded and will be available on Terence's website uh, later in the week. Item 1, apologies. opportunity to uh, interact with the alderman, the alderman can ask questions, seek clarification or whatever. So there is extra time available for that after the minutes. General Manager. Uh, thank you Mr Mayor. Our first speaker is Mr Michael Gear of Cambridge Road who wishes to address council in respect of this matter. We've got uh, three representatives and uh, one applicant and in the interest of uh, procedural fairness we've invited the uh, applicant to come up as the fourth speaker. Fourth speaker, yes. General Manager? Um, I think historically we've always had the proponent as, la as, as, as last but I'm not sure what the we meeting... We have done that previously. The meeting procedure rules leave it. I uh, might draw your attention also that the Mayor may make the determination on the approved deputations based on procedural fairness considerations. Uh, that's also in the policy. I apologise for that, but it's actually in the policy. <laughs> Good evening and thank you for allowing me to address you this evening. Don't get me wrong, we want something built on the site and what the Council has completed so far is excellent. We now have a proposal for a five storey hotel on the dinghy shed site which is acceptable. Worryingly, however, an additional five storey building will be built over the road from our home off an already very narrow footpath which will completely overwhelm us. This proposed building has a maximum height of 13.6 metres off the ground level. A telegraph pole is 6.6 metres above the ground. You are being asked to approve an 83 metre <coughs> building 13.6 metres above road level, so more than two telegraph poles high. Contrary to what the council planners have stated in their recommendation, we do not have 25 metres and four lane carriageway of road separating us, but just 20 metres, which is made up of four lanes of traffic and footpaths. Three words stick out in the town planners report, buffer, barrier and visual screening. All of this goes against what Lee Woolley recommended in his 2006 Hobart Urban Design Principles Project Report where he talks about elevation density which should be intrinsic to this development and all the way up to Waverley Flora Park. These buildings do not in any way meet the acceptable solution of two storeys. So you are being asked to override not the strategy plan 
developed in consultation with the community over a long period of time, recommended for this site. These days, everyone wants more. As this application shows in extending out over the water, the service department's been built over the right of way and levels 3, 4 and 5 extending to the edge of the footpath. But I remind the alderman, you have the power to approve, seek amendment or reject this current application. Once these buildings are in place, there will be no going back and unlike Mike Baird and his Greyhound band, you will not be able to back down and reverse the decision. All of our objections have been dismissed by council planners as unimportant. However, when you are retired and you spend the major part of your day in the personal space of your home and garden, they are important considerations for us. Indeed, I have been unable to find anything similar approved in the Hobart or surrounding council areas where a proposed building has affected a residential area in this way. As you might gather, when I believe an injustice is occurring, I will not give in easily and I sincerely believe the request for Building 2 to have four or five storeys in such a long building with no breaks and no setback is in the wrong and I hope you have the courage to agree with me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. Are you able to take some questions and provide clarification to any dollars and Kidd might care to ask for it? Yeah, yes. Yes. Are there any questions? Uh, Alderman Jones. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Geard, uh, are you aware in the Clarence Interim Planning Scheme there is a definition of amenity? Mm -hmm. uh, the amenity and definition means in relation to a locality, place or building, any quality, condition or factor that makes it or contributes to making the locality, place or building harmonious, pleasant or enjoyable. That's the definition. That is and, it, and you're probably aware well, of that. I'm well aware of that. Yes. And that's why I am so against the height of this building. You've, um, I just can't understand why a building that is 20 metres high has to have the ground level height 6.2, hang on, I just want to check this but I don't want to get it wrong. 0.15 metres high, then the first level is 3.15, so the, the ground level is actually double the first level. The second level, which is the first level of a service department, is 3.2 metres, the third level 3.72 metres, and has anyone ever had a roof that is 3.8 metres high? I don't think so. But, but the second question I have, Mr. Geard, is in relation to what would you see as a, a better alternative for the Building 2 that abuts uh, uh, Cambridge Road? Well, I, I really I fail to understand whether the Kangaroo Stage Plan has got the overall authority or the Clarence Interim Scheme Report of 2015 has got the overall authority because if you go to the Clarence Interim Scheme Authority Plan report, the, feet, the, the setback off Cambridge Road is supposed to be six metres. That doesn't say one side of the road can abut the footpath and the other side has to be six metres from the footpath. It says six metres for all of Clarence Street and all of um, <coughs> Cambridge Road. Just in regards, if I, if I can just give you these figures, because we went out and measured them this morning, and the Clarence, the Clarence Building, Clarence Street Building, I should say, has a distance of about 2.9 metres from the road edge to the building. The key building is 4.1 metres. Right, uh, extending out to about seven metres, and even the new units down on Cambridge Road in Kangaroo Bay itself, the measurement between the edge of the footpath and the building is approximately 4.9 metres. So 
quite considerably more, and I'm not sure if everybody realises that that footpath on Kangaroo, um, Cambridge Road, which this is going to abut, is only 1.6 metres wide. It is a very narrow footpath. And the first level, yes, it's going to have a bit of setback and a bit of gum. But then the second, third, fourth, and however many stories they end up building, is going to be 1.6 metres from the road. Pretty close. Can I just add one more comment? No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that there was a there was a chap who used to serve me petrol in the 60s uh, in England's barn called Bruce Gulak. And I tell you what, he was there for the battle and he would not have approved this as it is currently is. The council have bent over backwards and I admire the council for doing that bent up backwards to help the developer get this application through because it doesn't matter what objection we have, all of a sudden the objection is overcome. So Thank you. Uh, we'll take that as an addendum to your last answer. <laughs> Mr Mayor, I suppose we're trying to order the speakers in terms of procedural fairness as well. Um, but I'd ask Mr Robert Morris none if he can speak next. Yes, correct. Um, just my comment, um, Mr okay. Morris Nunn has his planning consultant with him so in terms of responding to questions. Mr Mayor, appropriate with you both, both are able to respond to questions. Yeah, that's fine. Well, we're in the interest of the, uh, the facts here, Alderman James, and I, I think it's quite appropriate that we are best informed as we can be in, before we consider the matter. Yes. Well, we have a very, very brief introduction. Um, the council and ourselves and I represent HUD's development first put it in the expression of interest for the project have been on quite a long evolution, if that's the right word for it, with regard to this project and um, a very other significant player involved in the exercise has been the Office of the Coordinator General and indeed the State Government. Because what we have here is not just a simple commercial development, although that's an aspect to it, it's also a very, very significant uh, sort of contribution to the training of the uh, future of our whole uh, tourism industry and in fact that is the primary goal of the whole development and in fact it is the whole development that has been looked at in that sense and the people that we are now working with in conjunction with the uh, state government uh, it is about providing a facility that would be of a national standard and grow to be of an international standard uh, for the training of the whole of the tourism industry going forward in this state and as it's going to be the first in Australia, it's going to be the sort of, if you like, the benchmark against which others are uh, measured. So it's not just uh, a hotel with that bit out the back or whatever, the whole lot is an integrated facility and we've tried to actually make that as um, coherent as we can within the terms of the planning scheme and what we've also tried to do is create an iconic development of which Clarence can be proud. So the building out the back that has been discussed, um, in fact, in fairness, if you measure the heights from Clarence Road, it is not 20 metres high. Um, the apparent height is um, much lower than that. Yes, about a, th a third of the building is below the Clarence Road line. Um, also, I'd like to comment that there is a glass facade to Clarence uh, uh, to Cambridge Road um, and that we will be, this will probably be the most heavily vegetated building ever constructed in Tasmania. So the quality of vegetation that is going to be going into this building is going to be a very, very significant sort of 
I think you could actually describe these buildings as, as sort of, yeah, the, the, the whole design. So what we're actually creating to, to Cambridge Road is a sort of a glass uh, facade behind which will be a very, very substantial three-storey sort of terrace garden. Um, and I think the, the outlook will be a very, very pleasant one. That's a highly subjective view. I'm interested in what Lee Woolley had to say um, because, as has been alluded, it has been um, the proposal will provide a distinctive focus and an architectural feature to extend. Okay. Okay. So look, the, it's interesting that the independent uh, review people that have been asked to look at this and who also made the council uh, guidelines are supportive of the whole idea. Thank you. Are there any questions or clarification? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm interested, um, Morris and Nunn, about the, um, the terminology that Mr. Woolley uses in his submission in as much as he says, the development proposal provides a considered response to the disturbant iron design principles and site development intentions for Kangaroo Bay. In the preceding paragraph, it, it does say, and I quote, the Kangaroo Bay Urban Design Strategy and Concept Plan, Master Plan, provided the basis for formulating the scheme provisions and as such do not hold any statutory weight in relation uh, in assessing this development application. So in his comments, Mr Woolley makes that uh, comment about a considered response to the urban design principles. But then on the other hand, there is no statutory provision to say what is the height of that building. Can you respond to that for me, please? Um, in general terms, uh, what we've tried to do is the mapping of both buildings has been balanced out to try and create a totality. The functional needs of this training uh, and hotel uh, is the sort of block that we have just put it there. And what we've tried to do is to sort of use that block across the site as best we can. So we've balanced things out to, to sort of try and give an overall impression. Uh, we haven't wanted to build the tower, we've not wanted to build the tower. Uh, we've tried to judge the, the land and the slope of land to, to do and yes, make it as best as we can. Do you want to say anything? Okay, it's about the planning stuff. Uh, just only in relation to your question about the difference between the design strategy and the planning scheme. Um, Lee Woolley is correct to say that the planning scheme takes weight over the urban design strategy. Um, the particular purpose zone that you're in is the standards and you can see the council report that effect. The urban design strategy might be at the end of the day, some vision for the future that was given, but it isn't how it translated to law. Um, as far as the scheme is concerned, the particular purpose zone is the law. Um, and in relation to Gid's comments, there is no setback on to Cambridge Road because the particular purpose zone overrides the other standards for that street. They might apply to, to his side or the other sites, but not to this particular zone. Relation to the term architectural response, because in um, section or 35.4.2 of the of SIPS Clarence Interim Planning Scheme, it says under D, increased height of building in the marina and wharf areas may can be considered where the development incorporates a scale and architectural response that is cognizant of its location and visual importance in the bay and surrounds. What, what constitutes an architectural response? Because it seems to me that you could build a seven storey building in the war zone and if it was of architectural um, response and is cognizant of its location and visual importance in the bay and surrounds, then it falls within this architectural response terminology. 
So is it possible if a building and we take, let's say the Belvedere Fee building which is about eight stories, if that was of an architectural response, you know, the design was of that height but it had a, a sort of a different shape and style, could it be built in the wall area and still meet that particular terminology of architectural response? I I believe we have tried to balance out all those different conflicting things and create a sort of an iconic building that did respond, complexly respond to all the needs of all the different people. It has been really carefully worked through the council offices and sort of, yeah, we want to, we want to actually give something that at the end of the day uh, is a very significant sort of uh, positive contribution to Clarence um, and something that will be a benchmark for the future as far as the iconic sort of uh, developments on this side of the river. Um, we think we can't do the right thing. We've tried to balance those out accordingly. We've, we've got a bank building and we've got a backdrop building and we've tried to balance the, the effects of the server. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The question is, is it five stories or four on building two? Yes. As far as stories go, um, it, it's really a, it's a, a four-story building with a root terrace. That's as far as the definitions go. And the fact that the, the root has a, has a cover over it doesn't necessarily make the roof under the planning scheme. It doesn't make it story as defined. Um, it would have to be an enclosed floor to be story. Mayor, just for the purpose of um, addressing this meeting, could um, Mr. Professor Nunn please explain uh, why floor one is, is 6.1 metres high? It's a, a two-storey atrium in one part, uh, but the base, it's, it's only two storeys, so they're, the, they're only three metres high, they're about the cost structure. It's only a portion of the building that's put there. The rest of the building is kept You actually said that the glass facade stroke vegetation, which takes on to Clarence Street, is going to have a pleasant outlook. A pleasant outlook for whom? Do you mean the residents that cross the road? Yes, and also from the guests staying um, in the building, so they're actually uh, moving through an environment that's sort of very, very sort of leafy. Uh, it's not the last thing I want to try and create is something that would be actually sort of work hard to get it. Um, so it's a, it's a glade atrium, um, and it's a, it's a very, very heavily vegetated uh, glade atrium over, over a number of levels. So as uh, Kate has referred to, Roof is in fact a garden, and the stories underneath uh, have these uh, glades, uh, well, uh, have, have these heavy gardens that are heavily planted on both to both levels. Did you have actually any interaction with the surrounding residents in relation to the design of the building? Not really, no. Um, I think that's probably a fair comment. Um, uh, we were sort of there, there has been an awful lot of sort of discussion about sort of through council with, uh, with the sort of other people like the, uh, the Bell Reef Yacht Club and, and sort of all of that, but so the whole civic promenade side of things um, was the main sort of trust. But, but look, can't be everything to everyone, I'd be the first to admit that. We've tried to balance out all the all the different values that we could in order to deliver something. So I think it's going to be you know, a very, very significant overall success. The state, not, not just the staff. This, 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 one, this one's got sort of very, very positive implications right across the board. I'm involved in, in sort of tourism development in other parts of the state. This will provide that, that people to actually sort of learn to use and man that facility. If we're building them better things, we have to be able to start currently, so we'll actually do that. I just wanted to ask you, uh, as we go to the allocation of the building on Cambridge 
road. Where, where do you actually, in your preliminary survey of the area, was there an opportunity to not relocate on Cambridge Road, but on the other side, more towards, towards Rodney Matrick College in that area? And if, if there was, if, or is there, or was there any opportunity, or is it that's the only place you could locate with that? That is the only, that, we had to stick within the title of the given, um, and that, yeah, we had that. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. Maybe the only time I we can ask this question, but you've, oh, also, right. well, you've, you've got a hospitality training school, I understand that. Not far away, there's the Rosie College. Now, I cannot say, and I don't know if it was ever discussed, that some of the college be built on and have that training school there, because it's only a couple hundred metres away. It would have dropped the height of that building, I believe, by probably a story. And the, compl the complaints I get about height, I believe, would have been alleviated. Was that ever discussed? It is an in-house training facility, the school and the hotel are literally mistimed because the activities are not remote for that very reason they, that a lot of the actual things that go on, the teaching will be going on within the hotel, both outside of the hotel. So it's not like moving some of them to, an, to another sort of teaching facility. That, that, for that you need to actually go to the Tate's people's side of our brief. But the whole thing is with it is a complete complex that's bound up together. I appreciate that. But when I look at the numbers of students, I just find it hard to believe that all those students are going to be working at one time in the hotel. And that's what I'm saying. I they, they, will be, they will be going out to other hotels. Yes. Um, and part of the... It's, it, is a, it is a very sophisticated apprenticeship system. So they won't be going elsewhere to be taught uh, in, the, in the court uh, teaching thing. They'll be going out to other... Hotel round, I appreciate that, and I think that's what we were told in the workshop. But what I'm saying, it could have actually been the actual training itself could have actually been a couple of hundred metres away from Rodney College, I believe, and that building could have been dropped in. Outside, so no, no, I understand that, but I did. I, thank you, Mayor. Are you effectively telling us that for this overall proposal to be viable, um, that this is the only, this is the optimum design and, and configuration for the whole project to be viable? Viable is a difficult word. It depends what you're talking about. It's not commercially, it's not about financial viability. It's about um, the running of this facility from an educational perspective. That is my understanding from discussions with Tate, who were involved in the exercise with state government before we got involved. Uh, and so uh, the Premier actually made an agreement uh, with the uh, educators a long, long before um, they were actually. So we were given a brief. Um, and, and so, so from that respect, yes, that is what was worked out. There, um, Mr. Morrison, I, one of the issues that's been raised in representation is um, the loss of views, and particularly Firstly, in relation to loss of views from Cambridge Road, I'm perhaps being a little blunt by saying they're not regarded as an amenity at law by the tribunal. So if it's a matter of whether one could approve or refuse something on the basis of loss of view to a residence across the road, 
from a residence to a, effectively a commercial zone um, that has a discretion on height above anything above two storeys? The answer is no. Loss of view is not protected. It's not regarded as an amenity in terms of in enjoyment of the property, and I know the amenity definition was quoted before. Um, view, I used to work a long time ago, and I didn't have grey hair, <laughs> in, in North City Council, um, for the council. Um, and this issue came up many, many times at law in Australia, and it's come up many, many times since. A view has to be bought, a view has to be owned. It is considered um, an, a commercial advantage by the law rather than an amenity. So, um, for example, in North Sydney, people would impose covenant restrictions on the height of the site across for them to say, well, you know, you can't build over this height and it's sitting on the title. It's a covenant of title control. And they would pay a lot of money to protect their view and to have that covenant on that title. Now, that is how views are protected. They are not protected at law through the planning instrumentality because they are not considered an amenity in the way that sunlight or privacy are considered an amenity issue. Um, visual bulk is considered an amenity issue. That is when something is right up, literally, you know, if it was right in the garden, that would be an issue. But we have a physical separation here of a road pavements, um, we have an expectation in a commercial sign of something that was going to go along there. If you recall in the scheme it talks about having activity on the Cambridge Road frontage, which would imply that it was at least anticipating a one or two storey building fronting Cambridge Road, because it talks about activity and, and having you know, shops and various other things along <coughs> that way. So if you go along those lines, a two-storey building on that side of Cambridge Road would block the views anyway. Uh, this is a three-storey with roof terrace. I think the views are already gone with a two-storey building from my perspective. Just final Thank you. Just uh, some consideration for me would be in looking at, in, in looking at um, gaining some more visual immunity along the roadway, which isn't a planning requirement. However, the, the pictures that are presented in the report, for me, I wondered if there was an ability for view lines to be incorporated in the actual development plan. They're not here in the report that we've been given. So I'll leave that to you to consider because looking at the pictures, and I'm, I have only got one angle. I'll leave it to you, uh, but I, I thought maybe the trees could be moved off to the right a bit more, and also if there was a um, gap between the building, whether that could be highlighted in some way. I don't. This isn't actually page number. It's the plan on your first floor plan on your agenda. The back, basically. There is a full landscape strip along the building from the foyer down, which will be a planted landscape strip before the pavement as well. So there, there is that proposed. So the only building that abuts right onto the pavement level is a small section that relates to the teaching part of the facility. Um, the rest of it is landscaped and as Robert has indicated, it has a double landscaping of a translucent wall with um, with a garden inside, literally, as well. However, when it comes back to that other section... Uh, I can do this time the day. No, I know. No, it was just an added consideration to move trees for a view line. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, there are no other questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robert Morrison. Thank you. And uh, General Manager. Next speaker is the Mayor is uh, Verity Coulter. Cambridge Road, which is also address council respected matter. Thank you, Mr. Um, <coughs> just to start with, we're not anti the proposal of the quality hotel and the train school. Our personal concerns relate to the height, the domination, both size and the commercial domination and those effects of the amenity, privacy, lack of effect to the historical aspects of our home, but also the wider village and kangaroo bay areas, the glare and the parking. 
and noise. Addressing the height or the domination in the context of the hotel training school focused on its core use will assist in resolving many of those issues. The proposal incorporates non-core uses through inclusion of commercial tenancy, which are not necessary for the development to go ahead. Their removal, together with perhaps some of the redesign and reduction in the number of rooms, delivers the opportunity to remove at least one floor and perhaps two adjacent to our property. With the gradual step up in built form to height similar to those at the southern end of the very village. The student cafe is unnecessary. There are numerous existing and substantial potential for other sites for such use elsewhere, so too with many other proposed commercial tenancies. Their removal supports other local businesses, further future business development opportunities, and the overall vision for the area as an area for the open movement of people throughout the area. The introduction of commercial tenancy also allows the further potential business domination by stealth. A caveat should be placed on the operation of the hotel and training school. Removal of the, the commercial property uh, tenancies allows heightened dominance reductions with follow-on benefits to parking, other business developments and the overall historical and other natural characters of the area. Those matters to occur that you've suggested about the reduction in the height and the commercial activities that would probably require new development. Yes. So um, the question is, the question is, um, the height of the building is that one of the key aspects? If, it, if you're trying to have a, a priority list and yep. those things, yep. would you say that the Building two on Cambridge Road is one of the key factors Absolutely. that is making this proposal not a go for you. A Absolutely. Could you um, just explain that? We, we're right next door. We're on the other side of the um, pathway with the Overhead Road overpass. Um, and from the plan, it's very hard to view, but it would appear that the train will be 11, 12 metres above our natural our existing roof line and some 17 metres above our outdoor living area. Um, just like to say, Mr Mayor, we've heard from uh, Mr Morris Nunn describing the fact that this concept, this development, this proposal uh, and the design to how it virtually has been done considering all of the, the need to in, embrace all of the concepts. And I think a number of the things that you have just mentioned that you don't need in this development are actually the key things that make it a viable for a developer. And that, that is our problem because there is all very well to have the very needs met, but there is also other things that have to be developed off that which will make the whole concept viable. And the concept, no, my question is, do you understand that? Yes, I'll come up with a compromise for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other mm -hmm. um, there. Uh, the um, officer's report said that in relation to uh, the issues of overlooking and privacy, um, they have recommended a condition be placed uh, on the development that um, the further development of the uh, screening of the areas that, that, that may cause privacy concern. Uh, do you think that there is a, a screening solution that, that may be acceptable to you that will address your research? Certainly it needs to be solid. Um, the, the problem for us is that the original part of the home is built in 1890-something, so a lot of it we don't have opaque windows and things like that at the moment to try and give us privacy on that. Southern wall of our home, so this is going to look faster in the living area, which is bedroom. So, um, evergreen trees, we've got reduced trees in there because we like to have the lighting, um, but obviously, some more evergreen trees and some solid um, screening would be great. A oh, question, Mr. Mayor. The, um, is, is your concern about uh, overlooking into 
um, areas inside your house or into private open space as well. Private open space in your backyard? Yeah. 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 Last speaking to Mary Lindsay McDougall from the Bell Road Yacht Club. Thank you. Um, well, I apologise for the availability of our two senior officers, the Condor and Ross Condor, who are sadly the job, so you've got me, unfortunately. Um, I'm a life member of the Bell Road Yacht so I've been a member for over 30 years. I've served in most roles here, and I'm pretty resident of the town. I represent in excess of 900 members of the BYC, the majority of whom are residents of Clarence. We're essentially an integral part of Bill Reeve. While governments, councils, and developers come and go, we are here for the long term and have recently celebrated our life. We've cooperated fully over the planning changes required to facilitate development, but there has been no direct consultation with these BYC by the designers and developers of this proposal, and much of the information is coming from press releases at this point. Club supports appropriate development in the precincts, and the main concerns relate to traffic management, car parking, BYC access, and the shared side of the park. We're pleased that some of these have been partially addressed. We already have issues at car park being used by local businesses and employees because there is no provision of long-term parking in the Bell Reef Village area. The variety of methods have been used by the Department of Council Traffic Engineers. It appears from the Council's report that the scheme could provide for up to 243 spaces while the proponent identified requirements under the scheme for 192 spaces. Whichever figures are used is a substantial shortfall. Council traffic engineers have heavily discounted the requirement and still identified deficiency of vacant for spaces. It is on this basis that Council has recommended to seek uh, 840,000 cash contributions in the work. Without a resolution to make a sh shortfall, the club will be further impacted. Cash in lieu does not represent the solution to the parking problem, and the BYC seeks a decision on when and where funds will be used to block the providers. Parking shortfall privately approved. There was the access. It's no longer clear how wide the proposed access uh, to the facility in BYC will be. The applicant has indicated agreement to remove the 10 spaces adjacent to the property. The BYC supports this proposal if it facilitates separation of vehicles from pedestrians and cyclists. Cyclists currently choose the shortest route from the BYC and beyond. This indicates that a dedicated cycle path or cycle route through the development is required and a more direct route. Traffic management plan in this DA also did not acknowledge the traffic moves to and from the BYC. It is still a long term aim for the BYC to close the entry access and use Kangaroo Bay Drive as their own access as provided for the scheme. Yeah, uh, through the process of asking questions or clarification, you can expand uh, as required. Okay. Uh, two questions. Um, uh, the first question is in relation to um, parking. Um, I, I understand there was a working party established over the years which the uh, yacht club was a member of. And, uh, and I thought there was some discussion about some planning for a, a car park, a multi-story car park, etc. Has that at all arisen in the discussions, <coughs> or has it just yeah, been highlighted? Like yes. Uh, well, there has been a mention of a multi-story car park. There's been no negotiations, no negotiations to how we fit in. Page 49 of the office report. Uh, it refers to mask requirements. And in the comment section of this, it says that in relation to items 
1 and 5, the wharf does not form part of the application, so obviously it's not a matter. But in relation to the other items, 2 and 3, it refers to, amongst other things, can mask be advised if the buffer zone under the roof and which extends 2 metres is planned as a no navigation zone. Has your group uh, sort of had discussions in relation to this or is it a, a matter that can be easily resolved and it's not a it's matter um, that can be... It, it, thank you, sir. It remains a concern of ours that this is not resolved and we would like a solution uh, and a solution through uh, consultation with the market. Also in question in item 3 in the uh, mass requirements, can a distance from the buffer zone to the existing BYC marina be given? It is essential existing BYC marina tenants are provided with a safe distance to be able to manoeuvre the vessels in and out of their pens and also to other berths to the south shore of the marina. Is that another matter that would need to be a condition is before this approval is given or is that, can that come later we, after this is approved? If I may, we do have development plans to expand the marina yeah. and uh, they're quite substantial and uh, we would like to get, get ahead with it. In the meantime, um, the designers have uh, Australian standards well standards for team and uh, passing lines and so forth. Um, that been brought back in the new plans and we expect that they would be adhered to by the We have already uh, uh, decreased the size of the footprint on our plans for the extension of the marina at Council's request to allow this to go So we think we've done our bit. Um, hopefully, we, it has reduced the size of the marina, which reduces the um, commercial liability of what we're trying to do, but we think we can still do it. The, the main effect is going to be on our parking. We, we require additional parking and additional parameters, and uh, that's planned to be put on the other half of that gravel um, area, which is adjacent to the hotel site. So the main concern is about car parking, not about all the Yeah, the main concern is car parking and traffic access, yes. Yeah, Can you clarify for me? You said that you that the Bell Reef Your Club has had no direct deliberation with the Delta. That's my understanding. I've been involved in, in a lot of the uh, what's going on. My understanding is we've had no direct contact. We've, we've, we've been talking to council officers, um, Crown, uh, state government people um, and uh, the mayor and other organs and so forth over a period of about three years. And, and our aim is to be to cooperate to allow a development to go ahead, but we don't want to have interests over um, here. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I need clarification from. Uh, an office in council. Am I able to do that over, over a particular matter? Um, in relation to the car parking, and you said you had um, intentions to expand your car parking. Did you have? Do you have the capacity to do that? Have you got the, the land there that was yours to actually consider that in the first place? We we've been in negotiations with the Crown for several years as part of all this concrete development, and yeah, that, yeah, I am envisaging that. that, that yes, I am envisaging that, but I'm, I'm just questioning whether you had the capacity to actually consider that as part of your expansion process. Our understanding from the Crown is that we will be granted lease over the heart of that area, which, which is the boundary of the hotel car park, and that 
is required on the outcomes. You would probably understand already that on a sailing day, especially the Wednesday evening, that gravel car park is part of the common way, and we're losing half that to our hotel. So we can't afford to lose it. Anymore. Just in, in relation to your long term experience with the yacht club, this development is proposing a ferry wharf adjacent to it. What would you say would be, how would a ferry coming in around the boat in any way interfere with that proposed so wharf? Just clarify that the application doesn't include, it foreshadows a future yes. ferry terminal. Yes. Yes. yes, that would be a separate issue. Separate. Maybe. Still an interesting question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, at this stage, we need to uh, fully consider the issue, and so I invite a, uh, a proposal for us to debate prior to voting on the application. Move the recommendation, all in the department. Speak the motion, all in the department. to support the officer's recommendation. Within the context of it, I find that the staff have worked diligently to try and fit a development into a very small piece of land. There has been a long-term strategy for development for the community in this area and I support the fact that this development will provide part way of those future development plans that we have. Um, Mr Mayor, we've heard here tonight that the actual concept of this development um, needed to create as small a footprint as possible with the constraints of the site. and. The developer has indicated that that is what they've attempted to do. So if we're looking at the actual reason behind the development, we can see that it needed to, to occupy a certain number of floors, it needed to occupy a certain amount of space. Kangaroo Bay as a development, everybody's been crying out, crying out for something to happen on the eastern shore that is going to be some significance. This concept represents that significance. It's of a benefit to the majority of people on the eastern shore and it also provides an alternate social scene for other people from the western shore and it's, it's hopefully going to join us together um, in that respect. The, the, we've heard here tonight that even if it was a two-storey development, which would be um, not even need any discretion, the, it would result in loss of use. Um, we've heard that we, and we know that from the conditions that the materials used, there'll be a full schedule of um, what will need to be to prevent glare and to prevent any offence from the materials used. Um, the design of the building has catered for the concept, as I've said before, and the, um, the further uses of the concept and the development are needed, as I stated earlier, to enable this whole thing to be viable. So there are a number of add-ons in addition to training school and in addition to the, the hotel development that actually need a developer to be able to say, well, look, I can make this work. I mean, it's all very well to come up with, with concepts, but you can't make it work un unless you're getting um, the finances through. Um, this development will no doubt drive the consideration of a proper long-term parking infrastructure or a multi-storey facility for parking because there will be added added um, commercial activity, there'll be added foot traffic, there'll be added vehicles through this area and the whole area will be totally revitalised. From a very yacht club point of view, the issues of access and the issues of car parking will be addressed within this concept as well. The, the presence of the well, yacht club does not get ignored, in fact it's actually quite part of this whole consideration and there, I know around the table we have considered 
um, bearing in mind what is beneficial for that club and this development actually and the um, access is the best um, concept for that. We have this within our notes and we've all seen the notes that there are a number of reasons why this development is very good for, for Clarence. And uh, we need something iconic, we need something that's really special, but before us in consideration we've, we've had a number of conditions, we've had a number of, and I think that as Council has presented this tonight that it is worthy of our acceptance as a recommendation. Uh, Mr Mayor, it's interesting that um, uh, the comment I made is earlier in the presentation was about amenity and I read the definition out and it's all there, it's in the, the SIPS Clarence Instrument Planning Scheme and it does in my view address uh, a number of factors which are covered in that section of the planning scheme which can address bulk, scale, size and that can impact upon the lifestyle, amenity and also what a visual outlook, outlook can entail. I understand what the planner mentioned earlier that the whole process within amenity, I believe there is that definition which can enable people to say that my lifestyle is going to be severely uh, or detri detrimental to my lifestyle because of this five storey building. It's interesting to note that on page 37 of the officer's report, and I quote, the rooftop garden is contained within the roof space itself as viewed from Cane Road and therefore contending that the building is five storeys and not, sto and not four storeys is irrelevant. So in actual fact, we have been told it's five storeys. Within the five storeys is the rick garden. And there's no doubt about that. It's a five storey development and that has also, and that has been acknowledged within there. The other point I want to make is in relation to the Kangaroo Bay Urban Design Strategy and the Concept Master Plan and which provided the basis for formulating the scheme provisions and as such does not hold any statutory weight, any statutory weight in assessing this development application. So we have this plan and we have the different zones. We have the boulevard, which is one zone, we have the marina and wharf, another, and the village. Four zones. And within that planning scheme, it spells out and it's, I'm quoting now from 35.4.2 on building height. Buildings under acceptable solutions, buildings are not to exceed two storeys in height at the frontage to a public road. That's the acceptable solutions. And both buildings under the proposal, one and two, exceed those storeys. They exceed two storeys. So we've established that in the wharf precinct, we have a five storey building on the Cambridge Road which is causing a lot of angst and concern to residents immediately opposite. The buffer between the building and their properties is not, as has been quoted in here, of being 25 metres and also uh, uh, the road width. It's substantially reduced and therefore I could contend that it's not a buffer in that strict sense. There's also been discussed tonight, and it was raised by uh, the planner, this question about architectural response. Now I didn't get a direct answer when I asked the question that if an eight storey building was built in the wharf precinct, remember there's four precincts, in the wharf precinct, if it was of an architectural response, compliant, or cognizant, I beg your pardon, of its location and visual importance, then there's nothing stopping. There's nothing stopping a 10-storey building with an architectural response, which could have all of its lovely paraphernalia, etc., etc., being built on the site. And I didn't get a direct answer because I know that if the architectural response and the conditions and its other uh, comments of its um, cognizance of its location and visual um, 
importance that you can have a building of X number of metres and five metres has just been uh, an example of where the scheme has and the performance criteria says the zone purpose statements, local objectives and desire do not specify any particular height height for the application site. And that's quite true. That's quite true. You can put a 10 storey building there if it meets this uh, legally proposal which he says, and I quote, the development proposals provides a considered response to the urban design principles and site development intentions for Kangaroo Bay. And that's that. And that's not in, in, uh, in law. It's not the statutory process. We have to go to SIPs and identify as to whether or not it's appropriate. Hang on, Mark. I'll speak. Oh, Jason. Yeah, Jason. Thank you, Smith. It is a very complex development application. Um, I'm not a planner, I'm not an architect, I'm not an authority on developing and operating tourism for my own. I do know that development, uh, this complex, is never going to automatically kick all of us. It must be some discretionary allowances. Does the city of Clarence need this type of development? I believe yes, that's all. Is Kangaroo Bay the right location? I believe yes, it is. Is it a design and architecture? I don't know. But I do know there are officers are recommending approval. So I do know the architect very curious. I, I do know that when the homes that are fully anticipated revenue take off all the anticipated expenses, then they will only continue if this equation is a positive result. We've been told that this design and configuration is what is required for this development to be viable as a tourist promotion development for the train to see. If it were not viable, it would not proceed. It's our responsibility to weigh all the information we have and to make sense of it based on that information. As I said, we're not planning our people or tourist accommodation experts. We must rely on our council officers by the end of the day to assess this and give us a vote. I acknowledge car parking is a concern, particularly the bell where we go up, but I do know on page 41, 5, 11, 11, the comment from the office is, the direction of the bell where we go up, but through the bell and the park is specified by a subdivision group and will eventually be established by land in the park. This way, I make provision for access between buildings one and two in accordance with the economy. Overall, I support the council's recommendation. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, <coughs> with the, the viability of the development is consideration for the developer in, in what they decide to put forward. It is not a, a relevant consideration. Um, but however, there can be times when compliance with the scheme and the viability of the development is equal balance in that. It's for the developer to weigh that up from the board of developers that comply with the scheme. Now compliance with the scheme means that first of all they either attempt to comply with the solutions or where they cannot comply with the acceptable solution, they then try to comply with the relevant performance criteria related to that acceptable solution. That's how the scheme works. There are two options when both the acceptable solution and relevant performance, relevant performance criteria cannot be met um, in a development. Um, one of those is to, is to review the development the other is to look at whether there are appropriate conditions uh, that can be placed on the development such that the performance criteria are met. And if the developer then chooses to accept those conditions, then they can follow the scheme. Now I've gone through uh, the officer's report um, in all its detail. And as far as I'm concerned, I understand that there are Places where in the scheme where the original proposal uh, did not meet with the scheme, however, uh, in those cases, the officers have put forward recommendations and the 
we develop the proponent accepted solution that therefore makes the development compliant. It seems to me that the, the key concerns, um, and there are a number listed from representatives, uh, but the two major concerns of the future of the late two car park and park. Um, the officers have gone through great detail in working out how many car parking spaces are required for this development. When it comes to um, the proponent not meeting the car park requirement, um, we do have the option of accepting a cash and loop contribution. But if we accept the cash and loop contribution, it's not for the developer to explain and demonstrate how uh, that's going to meet the housing requirement. That then comes in order for the council and it's not something that uh, factors into our um, uh, acceptance or other ones as well. The other um, issue has been in relation to height. Um, and I understand that has raised issues with loss of use and also with um, uh, privacy. Uh, privacy has been accepted as, as an issue uh, by the officers, but they have recommended a condition of the development that addresses that issue. In relation to um, loss of use, as uh, responded to by the proponent in my question, and, and I know that the um, planning officers would agree with me. The tribunal has never actually accepted loss of views as a as a um, immunity issue. That's a planning principle that's actually um, established right around Australia is that loss of views is not a planning consideration. It can actually be something that goes into um, setting uh, stand planning standards within the scheme, but it's not a it's not a relevant consideration. In terms of uh, Orrin James's contribution, um, no, the officers did not accept that the building was five storey height. They can actually provide a view as to whether it was four or five storey because uh, what they have explained is that it's not relevant. Um, what is relevant is the performance criteria is about that architectural response. And that can be a fairly objective thing to look at, which is why we um, you know, have engaged the services of the of expert in lean walking. Um, so I um, have no doubt that there are you know, very good concerns by the, the representatives who raised the representation they have. But in terms of our planning scheme, in terms of compliance scheme, in terms of our assessment, I cannot see any reason from a planning point of view to reject this tomorrow. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, every time we have a development in, in Bellary, if car parking comes up as, a, as an issue, it doesn't matter whether it's a doctor's surgery or the, or the key redevelopment, or there's always an issue. In, you know, people who park around there regularly know it's difficult. We have, however, a consistent policy that we've applied in this chamber of taking cash in room where there was insufficient car parking spaces. And we've used that Percy Street. That's what we've done in Percy Street where we got rid of the old building and put in more car park spaces. Uh, my understanding is that there is currently some $140,000 in the car parking reserve for this area along with 840,000 assuming this gets packed um, up tonight, that actually won't build a multi-storey car park but it will go a long way towards building a multi-storey car park which would alleviate problems not only for the hotel but for the yacht club and for the residents in the area who often have trouble parking. As several of the other aldermen have mentioned, yes, there are other issues with this, but I, like them, believe the planners have done a very good job in listing all those, considering all the those, and I will be supporting the planners' recommendation. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> I'd be able to speak, yes, I, I do support the motion, but I do have reservations about some of the objectors' uh, complaints about 
size, which I've mentioned before. I, I've always said we need some accommodation on the eastern shore, but I didn't think that was going to involve a Tate training school as well, because I think you know, if that was relocated somewhere else, the size of the building could be reduced and we wouldn't have had uh, any objection at all. Uh, as Alderman Chong said, parking has always been an issue. We've discussed parking now for, I don't know, two or three years in uh, Bell Reeve and Rosney. So that's always going to be an issue to this council finally resolves it. This is a development which you know, I, I support. I'm, I'm not jumping over the moon about it because I think that there is some things that probably could have been done differently because this is a very vital area. But I think Alderman Hong said, you know, under the planning scheme we understand why the officer's recommendation is as such and, you know, really, I think we've got to support it, but I do think there are some flaws that probably could have been handled differently. Yeah. 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 Kangaroo Bay. Kangaroo Bay is crying out for high quality development. It's going to be a great asset to the community. Uh, I know there are certain problems regarding parking and relocation of the training school. I would have liked to see the training school decided somewhere else. Uh, all the Kim says uh, we're not concerned with viability, but the point is if we uh, try to change the uh, plans to such an extent that viability is a, a concept which is not uh, considered, and uh, the well, proponents will just walk away from it. I think um, uh, cash and lose them. Parking, I think parking is um, quite a problem. There's 74 space short, uh, but um, cash and lube will go as long as the uh, Chong said, uh, on the way to helping us develop a uh, multi-story car park in the recent vicinity of there and what's what we want We've heard tonight a number of deputations from residents who are concerned in relation to loss of immunity, loss of views and that thing. And they are very important to those particular people. However, we've also heard from the applicant in relation to the strategic nature of this development. And I think it's important to keep in mind that in representations that we've received that there were several representatives who actually were in favour of this development and who believed that it would be a major attraction, it would create employment, it was visually very pleasing and that it was imaginative and innovative. So we have those two aspects, looking at it strategically and looking at some very valid concerns. From my perspective as the Chair of the Bicycle Committee, the Bicycle Security Committee, which is a lovely name, all of the representation that were received in relation to the Clarence Foreshore Trail and the cycling and pedestrian issues appear to actually have been taken on board by the developer and that they are going to work very closely with Council in relation to actually meeting those needs that were seen by Cycling South and Bike Network Tasmania and our community. So I'm very pleased to see that the applicant, the developer, is actually working very closely with our council officers and members of the community who have concerns. I would like to actually see between now and hopefully the development occurring that there is also some consultation in relation to those valid issues about the concerns of the immediate residents. It appears that the developer has not actually had direct consultation with both, both, both by residents and also the Reef Yacht Club. I understand that Council and Crown etc. have had consultation with 
golf club, but perhaps there is room for negotiations, discussions, explanations, <coughs> more explanations in relation to what this development will actually look like and the concept of the development. So I do urge the developer to actually do that consultation and negotiation with the immediate residents. I believe this application addresses a long term need and some strategies within our council direction. From a social point of view, I believe that it does create better community and social outcomes with regards to the foreshore trail. And hopefully in the future it will link to other establishments that create um, broader outdoor uh, eating facilities or accommodation in a tourist sense. Economically I think that this gives us a good foundation to set up this whole area uh, with new jobs and development that create and revitalise that section of our city. We are badly lacking in the promotion of extending a city and I always have high hopes of having a second Salamanca place. However, the community, uh, with relation to comments uh, about evalu elevation density, from my perspective, the planning perspective, I believe that these only relate to the residential areas in the context of that was put in the report um, and not to this particular area which is a special area zone. And it was designed this way to be able to allow particular sections to be able to be given the ability to develop in such a way that it created a viable economic outcome for any developer in the area. The current application, again, it was stated, does not create uh, any solar uh, compromise. However, there could be a little bit further investigation on the needs of residents and their privacy. And I believe those can be individually addressed. Um, and also maybe some consideration of trying to alleviate a better views through to the border. However, I do think the representative of concerns have been considered and that such a small site really needs uh, to have a certain amount of certainty and that our special zone created that situation. I think it, it will be an iconic development that will give something to build on and redevelop our city the way we have envisaged it would go. And I recommend the staff on their work with this application and seek support of council. Thank you. So the motion before the chair is also recommendation to approve the hotel and so we will just decide to do the day.